welcome to the Booker Prize podcast with me, James Walton. And me, Jay Hamia. And today we've got um, well, a special treat, so we like to think most episodes are a special treat, because we've got an interview with George Saunders, one of the great writers in the world, in fact. And we'll be talking to him about his Booker-winning novel, Lincoln in the Bardo. The enormously distinguished uh, American novelist who uh, won the Booker Prize in 2017, making him the second American to win after Paul Basie with The Cellar, as we've discussed on this very show. Uh, the shortlist in 2017, was we're nothing if not Booker completists here, were Paul Oster's 4321, Autumn by Ali Smith, Exit West by Mossy and Hamid, uh, Fiona Mosley's Elmet, and Emily Fridland's History of Wolves. So do you want to tell us a bit about Lincoln in the Bardo, Joe? Yes, I suppose I should start by explaining what a Bardo actually is. Why not? It's derived from um, a Buddhist concept. The Bardo is kind of what we think of as uh, purgatory. It's a space between life and death. It's where the spirit goes after dying, um, if it still has some attachment to the world. But Saunders has kind of altered the concept um, so that instead of moving on to a new life, as you would do under Buddhism, um, it, you just die. So uh, the book takes place uh, sort of against the backdrop of the Civil War, and it opens on a reception that Abraham and Mary Lincoln are holding at the White House while their son, Willie, is upstairs, grievously ill, and, and he eventually succumbs to his illness uh, and dies, at which point he um, enters the bardo with a lot of other spirits. A lot of people in the Bardo don't actually believe that they're dead. We get a lot of very beautiful backstories to how they died. Uh, there are characters like Hans Fullman who um, died when a beam fell on his head, but he was about to go and finally um, consummate his marriage with his lovely young wife. So he died with a massive hard on which only increases in size <laughs> as the book goes on. Um, uh, but, but, but none of them believe that they're dead. They just believe that they're s sort of ill. It takes a while. They keep talking about the being in their sick box. And yeah. we gradually realise that means coffee. Yes. Lincoln's son, Willie, is quite a peculiar instance because children aren't really supposed to linger in the bar, do they? They don't really have enough experience or life to hold on There's to. They're meant to pass on yeah, quite yeah. quickly. But very soon after his death, and this is, I believe, a, a real historical fact. Lincoln visits Willie's tomb and holds his dead body and promises his son that he'll return. And Willie hears this and is kind of unable to communicate with his father, but decides that he's going to stay in the bardo and wait for his father to come back. But this is sort of a problem, as we learn from another ghost called the trainer girl. Children who stay in the bardo begin to manifest as a horrible, nightmarish visions. Yeah, all sorts of horrible things to happen to them. Yeah, and so the other ghosts in the bardo are kind of desperately trying to get Willie to move on, rather unsuccessfully so, and he begins wasting away. Which makes this book sound really heart-wrenching. At times it is, but at other times it's just quite funny, actually, if the, <laughs> if the erection story wasn't enough. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, and there's, it's a, there's a sort of two inter, continually interspersed things, which is the activities in the bardo. With you've got the main two characters, Hans and 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 who and Roger, who committed suicide uh, because his male lover had sort of gone off and said he wasn't uh, that he was going to go with women. Actually, that, that he just had to, and he he cuts his throat and then realizes actually, I I know that was a mistake. The world so, is beautiful. Yeah, the world is beautiful. I'm going to hang around now. Anyway, the, so the, but also dozens and dozens of other people tell their stories. There's a book absolutely crammed with stories of people's lives, and uh, and that is interspersed with uh, historical facts about uh, Lincoln. So this is 18, 1862, the Civil War's in its second year, and it's not going terribly well at this point. Yeah. So we so we get the historical background at the same time in in the form of, of little snippets of um, archive primary and secondary archives. If we're making it sound a peculiar book, I think that's pro probably right, but you get used to its peculiarity really, really quickly, and life in the Bardo seems like life in the Bardo. Yeah, it's a very kind of, um, I think the way it's always described is that it's experimental or stylistically strange. It is really fragmented in every sense possible. Um, you kind of, the ghost stories are kind of told in monologue and kind of, names of the speaker are given below as if it was kind of a script. Meanwhile, the um, historical parts of the novel are about 
Lincoln and the White House and the Civil War are given as sort of fragments, excerpts um, that tie together but also contradict each other. And um, But it's sort of, to me, all the more beautiful for that. I know, you, I think from a writer's point of view, you admire the astonishing craft in Volta. I think this is, I'm starting, this is the first thing by George Saunders that I've read, but I'm starting to understand why he's kind of thought of as a literary guru. He teaches at Syracuse as well yeah. uh, on a kind of intensive writer's program. I totally get why people would go to him to kind of try and master their craft. He's unbelievable. I suppose if, 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 if anybody doesn't know him, he, he um, although Lincoln in the Bardo is his first and so far only novel, uh, it's, it's, um, it's very, very well established short story writer. Yes. Normally, normally referred to as the world's greatest living short story writer. Um, so, in a way, you can see the short storiness in the, maybe in the fragmentation of Lincoln in the Bardo. But we both loved it, didn't we? Really? Yeah, we did. When he also, I should mention, he wrote an unbelievably good book. Uh, this might not sound alluring, but trust me, you should go for it. On the Russian short story called "A Swim in the Pond in the Rain," and it's he takes seven classic Russian short stories and basically reads them astonishingly closely and um, makes you love them and love those stories and actually love him quite a lot uh, in the course of that book. So without further ado, here's our interview with George Saunders. Yeah, let's go. Probably should warn you, the sound quality here in the interview isn't, isn't unbelievably fantastic, which is to say it's occasionally a bit dodgy, but I really urge you to keep listening because what George Saunders has to say is fantastic. So, question number one. <laughs> God. Um, well, since we are the Booker Prize podcast, I just wanted to start. I'm always curious um, about how Booker authors remember the night of the ceremony, especially when they won. Do you have any memories of that night? Vaguely. It, I'm kind of, I, I kind of blacked out. <laughs> no, it was really a, a wonderful thing because it was kind of a surprise. The, the kind of, um, the rumor mill was like, an American's not winning this year. This, go and have some drinks and, you know, uh, and so I thought, oh, that's great. And it was such a beautiful place, you know, <clears throat> and then um, I kind of remember he hearing uh, Lincoln, the word Lincoln, and then everything kind of froze, you know, and it was just a, a great, it was really professionally the, the best night of my life. It was so much fun, partly because it was unexpected. And um, yeah, and then it was just a feeling of kind of like, um, well, approval, certainly, which is, you know, I, I have a I have a weakness for that. Uh, but also it was a credential in the sense that now wherever you go, you're the person who won the booker. And it's kind of a um, I found it to be kind of a, a, a license to be more daring in my work, which is strange to say. But somehow having the endorsement of that sort of august um, prize made me think, well, yeah, if, if it seems like a good idea to me, I should try it. You <laughs> know, So. Uh, and then you kind of swept into appearance after appearance. For that week, yes. There, there's a, I mean, even that night, it was funny because you sort of feel like just having a bunch of drinks and cutting loose, but then you're kind of taken off to interviews. And um, by the time you come out, the party party's over. Oh. Uh, but then for a, a few, I think three or four days after, it was just steady, steady interviews. And then uh, I came home and um, even in the States, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of, uh, the, the, the prize has an amazing amount of power, as you know, and it was really quite a thing for for uh, a month, maybe, you know, and then I started sort of deciding to quiet things down again and get back to work. But it, it was really lovely. Yeah. And of course, you won your book, the Booker Prize with your first novel. Uh, but unlike m most first novelists or many first novelists who've won, you were already established, indeed, prize winning author for short stories. Um, why did it take you so long to get round to a novel? Uh, well, I, you know, my, my wife kind of kiddingly says, you didn't write a novel yet. That's, that's, a, there's a lot of white space in that thing. You know, um, I, I don't really have much desire to be a novelist. I love the short story. And so it was really just the case that this particular material, uh, demanded, to, you know, more pages. And I, I was fighting it all the way. I kept saying sort of to the book, don't humiliate yourself. You know, <laughs> if you, if you can be 30 pages, let's be 30 pages. Uh, and then at certain key moments the book very politely said no i think i need to be you know have a little more more length and uh so it was kind of a, a process of i guess just respecting the material you know really uh 
and and not you know I think a work of art really it, it it's at its best when you're being kind of mutually respectful. So I'm saying to the book, I want you to have every page you need, but not a page more. And the book is saying, okay, I understand that. I, I won't, um, I won't cause you to start just uh, producing empty pages, you know. So that was kind of the contract I had with this book. And then I looked up, and it was 300 pages, but it, you know, it, it, I felt like it had sort of earned them, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I'm really intrigued um, with the idea of white space in this novel. And I, I read that um, at one point you tried it as a play, um, which makes sense with the kind of monologues that the ghosts have. But I'm I'm really curious. I mean, you're kind of uh, like anthropomorphizing the manuscript. Like, did it say to you that mm -hmm. it had to be a novel? Why did it have to be a novel? Yeah, no, it's such an interesting question. I had, you know, we had, um, I, I visited this graveyard maybe 20 years before I started the book. And I heard that anecdote about Lincoln going to visit his son's body. And instantly I thought, oh, that's that's a good book for somebody. Not for me. <laughs> it's too earnest. I can't do it. And so then at one point, I, it, the idea was nagging at me all those years. So I um, I said, OK, it's I'll, I'll write it as a play. That'll be somehow uh, liberating. And it was a real dumb play. I'm not a playwright. And it was just a lot of it was a lot like a kind of a uh, a school production. You know, hello, I'm Abraham Lincoln. I was the president of the United States. Um, but I couldn't give it up. I, even though I, every time I read it, I think, oh, there's something wrong with this. Uh, but I couldn't quite give it up. And finally, one uh, New Year's Day, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just kind of um, write a note to myself about what I hope to accomplish this year. And across that manuscript, I said, do not continue. Throw it away. It's garbage, you know. Um, and so that was supposedly dead. And then I was talking to um, a former student, and he said to me, if, I think if you ever wrote a novel, it would be a series of monologues. And something in that, you know, to say, okay, it's not a play. It's actually a novel in an unusual form. It just threw open a door in my head, like, oh, I know how to do that. The voice is all wrong. And I think with the play, I've been, I've been kind of trying to be sim simple. Uh, and as soon as I said, oh, no, it's a, it's a work in prose, uh, I gave myself permission to use higher language and make jokes and the whole thing. So just that mental construct of saying, oh, yeah, it is a novel, even though it looks like a play, kind of threw the, the windows open in a way that was really surprising. I read your Paris Review interview and got really stuck on the fact that um, in it, you said that when you submitted to your editor, he said he liked 80% of it or that 80% of it was there. Um, but you didn't say what the other 20% was. Was it anything significant or difficult to fix? Um, no, no, really. It was just overwriting that, you know, you sometimes mm -hmm. get in that mode of being a little too fond of your own shtick, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so I think in that original one, it, it I remember that as a real vote of confidence because it was such a strange form. And it, and at that point it already had the historical references in it and stuff. And he didn't even bat an eye at that, but I think at the same time he wanted me to, um, recognize that we had work to do but I, as i remember it it was just him showing me places where i had overdone it a bit and thereby undercut the the, the fictive illusion you know uh, sometimes you can feel a writer gets a little too excited you know and it's it's just a sense of being a little too fond of one's own work you so you uh are currently uh on a on a publicity tour for liberation day which is a return to short story form um and and we'll come back to that in this interview. But at the moment, I was wondering whether you're likely to write another novel and whether there was anything, I guess, formally that you discovered in novel writing that you didn't, that maybe you haven't touched upon in short stories or, or indeed writing plays yet. Yes. I mean, well, one thing, this is kind of crass, but it's just the the amount of attention you get for a novel and the amount of engagement that readers have was really amazing. You know, they have a sustained narrative. Um, so, yeah, I hope so. I'm working on something now and we'll see. Right now it's about eight pages of sheer hopefulness, you know, so we'll, we'll see. But I did I did enjoy um, with that Lincoln book. There was a moment where I was probably about 20 pages in and it seemed like it would be safer to quit. And then something said, well, just just keep pushing. And, you know, if you if it's no good, it's only a year of your life. No big deal. Uh, but there was something thrilling about that, maybe especially a little later in life, to be in a position where you could will something uh, into a bigger form. And in the process, I, I felt like I learned so much, as you suggest, about form, for sure, mm. but also about yourself. Um, and 
I found that that book got into a certain space where I felt like the reader and I were taking a really strange chance together. Uh, you know, where, where I was saying, I believe in you. And they were saying, well, all right, I'll believe in you. That I'm, I'm hungry to do again, if, if I can. So we'll see if this current project turns into, you know, that or, or a pile of papers in a dustbin. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, uh, let's t- just, just a couple of questions about Lincoln, actually, because obviously quite a, not only a big subject, but quite a well-covered one. What, 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 why did you decide you, you'd ever go at Lincoln as well? Really, the idea just kept eating at me. I had so many good reasons to not do it, and I kept telling the book, "We aren't going to do that." And um, every time I would, I would have another moment of artistic success. That book would say, "How about now? You know, you're good enough. Try it." So it was just really the, the material being persistent. And as you're suggesting, one of the terrifying things is to write about Lincoln. You know, it's like writing a book about Jesus or something. It's just, you know, it's been done. It's been done thousands of times. So to try to find something new to say. It would be so easy to just make a caricature representation of Lincoln, that, you know, uh, or a corny, a corny representation. So it was a real, it was really threading a needle. Uh, and in the end, that's what was exciting about it was, you know, nobody knows who Lincoln was. No, no one will ever know. He was a man from a completely different time. His mindset was completely different. So then it becomes, well, he's me, you know, or he's at least some projection of of me. So it was a real challenge. And to try to, you know, I, I often think when you're writing about somebody like this, you you don't want to show them too much. You don't want to show them in full light. Mm. And you want to understand that even a, a guy like Lincoln is, you know, mostly he he's a middle-aged guy who just lost his kid. So that's kind of universal. Also, it's a cold winter night. So 60% of this phenomenon is physical. You know, he's just out in the cold. So So it became kind of a magic trick of appearing to represent him which is kind of a, um, it's an illusion, really. You know, you're, you're, I'm taking my phenomenon and general phenomenon and putting it all together and showing it to you very quickly so you don't have too much time to, to distrust it. And that's Lincoln, you know. I've wondered, um, is, why, why not just let the South go? Why, why not just let it have its little slave republic and see how far that goes in, in the mid-19th century? Um, and it doesn't seem as if, from what the historians I've read, that he did, you know, it seems as if he could have preserved the Union without freeing enslaved people he would have done. So that wasn't necessarily the motive. Why, why, why was the union so sacred to him? Yeah, I think this is one of the places where it's our, our inability to imagine a, a 19th century mindset really comes into play. Because I've had the same idea. Just let them, let them go, they'll fail. Okay, and they would have failed, you know, be, yeah. just for economic reasons. But I think, you know, if you read his early writings, it's all about union. You know, that was a real thing. Uh, I think for, for our country to have made this union fairly recently at that point, uh, so it had a kind of a value for for them that maybe we can't quite imagine, I think. So or initially it was that, and then Lincoln himself changed. So early on, as he said, he, he didn't care. I mean, I think he was he was repulsed by slavery. He hated it, but he would leave it in place, he said, if it would save the Union. Then there was a famous moment where he called a bunch of African-American leaders to the White House, and his intention was to convince these, was all men, convince these men to buy into a scheme to repatriate every black person back to Liberia. That was the plan. This was an actual plan that people discussed at the time. And uh, he he floated this plan and whatever happened in that meeting, he was so ashamed of himself afterwards. And I think what happened was these people said, sir, we've been here longer than you have, some of us. We're citizens, this is an idiotic idea. So he, after that meeting, he he never proposed it again. And it, it, there was a real change in his in his thinking about it. And also at the time, he was getting reports from the front of these heroic black soldiers uh, who faced a lot of peril that if they were captured, they'd be executed on the spot, unlike their white compatriots. So, so there was this change in Lincoln's heart where he actually started to to understand what was at stake. And um, so so I tried to mimic that and to have at the end to have him sort of go from uh, I'm just to save the union to actually this is much more uh uh, major and and morally inflected than I ever knew before. So that was kind of the the, uh, the formal intention of the book. But to your question, I don't really know. I, I'm not sure. But you 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 were you were born in Texas, I believe, although you grew up in Illinois. Do you ever feel sudden? Have you got sudden roots? Y- yes. I mean, I was as a kid uh, in Chicago. I was always very proud of being from Texas. I thought it was like my you know the thing that made me different. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. You know, even as a kid, I can remember a lot of 
sort of vaguely Confederate overtones. People talked about that war in a, in a way that was weird, you know, and very strange. Um, yeah, so I, I thought it was, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I was always, my grandfather was a traveling salesman in Texas. And so when I went down there, uh, I was the only grandson and he would take me on his route around these, these tiny towns in, in North, Northern Texas. And so I had a lot of fondness for that, that period. You know, he would kind of take me to these small towns and we'd go to a bar and he'd kind of show me off. This is my grandson. He's a Yankee, you know, <laughs> and then they, you know, <laughs> yeah. talk in my Chicago accent, and, you know, <laughs> I mean, so one of the things that this conversation is making me think about is that um, in the process of publicizing Lincoln and the Bardo, you you sort of simultaneously, alongside becoming a, a the author of a novel, became a kind of political pundit. Um, <laughs> there was a lot to talk about <laughs> around 2016 and 2017. I wonder um, how you think back on that i mean is it something that you expected to have to do during the writing of the book and how did how did you find sort of having to explain the contemporary state of america whilst trying to market a yeah. book uh, i feel i feel a little bit uncomfortable because my level of political knowledge is about that of somebody's drunk uncle at a party you know i, I don't i'm all opinion and no <laughs> no you know factual basis but sometimes in the, you know in this job, and especially after the Booker, you know you you get an opportunities to to say things, and I it's something I really struggle with because I don't want to be facile, and I don't want to neglect anybody else's experience. But at the same time, I don't want to be somebody who had an opportunity and didn't use it. You know, um, so I kind of just try to proceed on the basis that you know every every human being is just as real as the other, mm. and even your enemies. But, their worldview makes sense to them mm. and it doesn't make sense to you. And so there, there are ways that you can, uh, I think, especially through literature, you can talk past the, the kind of surface level banter, sometimes very aggressive banter that constitutes most of the public discourse these days. You, you can talk directly to the better part of the, of the person. But um, on the other hand, I've been really frustrated that I don't get many converse from the other side. I did I did a piece where I um, followed the Trump campaign around and went to the rallies and was down there on the ground and had some great conversations. Uh, didn't change a single mind, you know? <laughs> and so I, I should have I should have brought copies of the novel and handed it out. That probably would have done the trick. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. This idea of of being given a platform and using it for for something to say is that part of the motivation to have a Substack? I started doing that partly because I've written that a swim in the pond in the rain, this book about Russian literature, and I really missed that doing that kind of close analysis. And mm. so Substack offered you know a little incentive to do it, and I thought I'll try it. And it was um, almost instantly clear that this community was so positive. It was really strange. I thought my my fear was that. Suddenly I'm on the internet, you know, and I have to fight somebody every day. And it was so much the opposite. So many bright people. Um, it's really like a huge class. And for some reason, the, the vibe in there is very positive and very supportive. So I've, I've become really a little bit addicted to it just as a part of my intellectual life, because I get to now at about maybe once every three weeks, we introduce a new story and we analyze it. And I learned so much from the comments and it forces you to back up your opinion by writing about it. Mm -hmm. which is a really good way to clean off any any facile ideas that you have. So I've, I've really loved it. And um, yeah, and I think a lot of writers are doing it because it does, um, if you're a person with a lot of ideas, uh, an active mind, uh, it's sort of hard to publish all those. I mean, even if they're good, there's not that many venues. So here you have a way every week to publish. Uh, and there is a way that the <clears throat> a piece on subject can make it into the broader culture and the broader, larger discussion. So uh, I, I haven't used it really. I've been very disciplined about not being political in there uh, and just sticking to technical writing technically about stories, you know? Um, and I think I probably stay that course because it, I think that's partly why the, the uh, community is so, so positive. We don't get off into the weeds at all, but um, no, it's been really interesting, really exciting. I do wonder now that you've returned to short stories, whether that direction that your life has taken, is it, teacher and instructor of writing has newly influenced your short stories or made you more self-conscious in any way while writing? Yeah, I think um, that's an ongoing battle, you know, to kind of, and it's been my whole, I've, I've been teaching since the, you know, middle nineties. So 
there's always that moment where you say, okay, I've been talking a bunch of theory or, you know, or, or, or as we call it, talking a bunch of shit. And then <laughs> suddenly you, you have to then, you know, pivot to being an artist, which is not about rational belief or, or willing yourself to do this or that or, or fulfilling this theory. So I've been doing that pivot my whole creative life, really. Um, the, the swimming upon the rain helped me a little bit just to see um, what the current limitations of my approach were. Yeah, in reading Chekhov, you go, oh, I, I never thought of doing it that way. Um, but so, yes, I think a little bit. It, it's kind of both beneficial and could be harmful. Mm. So I, I think so many things in art, it's okay. Everything's okay. You just have to be aware of it. So I'm I'm aware of the idea that I, if I'm talking theory or, you know, analysis uh, 40% more, I have to be that much more careful when I go to work. I really like what you said. I can't remember which interview this is, but um, somewhere you said that uh, the charm an individual has um, will immediately translate into the charm they have as a writer, that the, the two cannot be mutually distinct. And I was kind of wondering, like, what your particular how you see that in yourself like what aspects of you which need to please or persuade or charm translate onto the page i i think frankness you know mm -hmm. I, I think a, um an, a, a willingness to say something and go ah eh, that's nonsense you know that mm -hmm. that's something that i i feel strongly as a person i i um i'm neurotic i guess basically but i can see <laughs> uh several ideas at once if you ask me a question i have i have you know so i've been able to kind of find a way to get that on the page a little bit which often translates into humor you know if mm. somebody makes a strong position and then runs around the other side of the table there's something funny about that so i think there's kind of a, a, a frankness and what what that means for me is that i'm trying when i'm writing i'm really trying to imagine the reader as a, a, a co-partner in the enterprise so i'm trying to respect her uh, i'm trying to imagine her as being like me uh, maybe even a little smarter, a little better traveled, a little more sophisticated. And so <clears throat> as I'm editing, I'm really trying to imagine this better person that I'm trying to befriend. Th that's a, a form of frankness too, you know, to say um, at a certain point, you know, you can say uh, this, I I'm aware that this part of the story is landing on you in this way. Let me address that friend, you know? Uh, so I think that's, that's the part, but you know, this idea of, of charm, it, when I teach at Syracuse, I'm trying to tell my students that the first move that most of us do when we write is we put up a front. You know, we're, we're trying to imitate the, the beloved writers that we've known. That doesn't actually work. You know, we, we even if you imitate Rushdie really, really well, you're not Rushdie, even if you imitate any, you know. So the idea is go, go ahead and do that and you'll be frustrated because you'll feel that you're a, a, a light version of that writer. And at some critical moment, you'll start to really squirm because the things you actually know in your life aren't showing up on the page, you know, mm -hmm. the, the costs that you've paid. And, the, you know, so then at that moment, I will say to them, what, how are you charming in real life? You know, is that, is that there it is, you know, if you're a funny person, are you being funny? If you're somebody who is a great listener, is your great listening, making it onto the page. And that's really the moment where a young writer will sometimes make a leap. Uh, and, and it's such a, re and it was for me such a relief because instead of keeping your best gifts outside the door, you, you let them in and you're just yourself, you know? So that's, um, the, the problem is it's not, you can't simply decide, oh, what are my charms? I'll make a list. It's, it's much more intuitive and iterative and it takes a lot of rewriting, I think, to, to get there. But, but it starts with a feeling of frustration that what you really know is not showing up in your work. Mm. or what you really care about is not showing up in your work. Uh, with, with, with your work in Lincoln in the Bardo and the, and the short stories in Liberation Day, it's sometimes yeah. hard to tell. Well, Lincoln in the Bardo was described as wildly lots of things. And it, <laughs> some, sometimes you see, you know, it seems you're just letting your imagination go where it will. Stories are piling up, characters are. And sometimes it seems as if it's under completely tight authorial control. Uh, which of those is it, do you think? Or is it... It's it's both. It's both. So you it's almost like you have two hats. You have the wildly uh, anally expulsive hat, put that one on and just go to town. And then you also have a, you know, for me, it's like the inner nun, which put that hat on and suddenly you're editing and cutting and, and shaping. So I think for me, it's you have to have both. You know, um, David Foster Wallace used to talk about this, that a, a, a new writer thinks that if she feels it and types it up, you'll feel it. 
And a more experienced writer knows, no, it's a totally different thing. You, you're putting together words on the page with the intention of uh, affecting the reader. But that in itself is an open question of how to do that. You know, So for me, I'll, I'll have a really wild uh, time it, knowing that tomorrow I'm going to have to come back and tidy up the room, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, and actually, one thing, which Liberation Day, which I, again, greatly enjoyed. Any, uh, again, the mixture of wildness and tight control and everything. Any of those stories that you particularly commend to the reader? Um, I'm, you know, as as the book uh, sails away, I, I'm kind of fond of Elliot Spencer. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's one, it's the second to last, and, and it's a kind of a difficult, weird, experimental thing. But I really, um, I, I, I like that story. And, you know, on the audio book, Stephen Root read it. And he did such a beautiful job and it kind of opened the story up for me again as a kind of, oh, that's, that's a, you know, sometimes it's a certain story will be a pathway to the next thing. And reading that whole book, that one in the title story kind of make me think of what I might be, be th those, those ideas are still alive for me. So they uh, kind of speak to what might. Uh, uh, Elliot Spencer's where people have those sort of memories scraped and they're re-employed as political protesters. Yeah. It, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is which no, is going to happen next week, I think. That's that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a terrific. In that case, I think I think that's uh, unless you've got anything you're bursting to say, that's been fantastic to have you, and thank you very much. No, no, thank you. I love being here. Thanks for the beautiful questions. No, thank you, George. It's been lovely. They sort of say never zoom your heroes. Are we, are we glad that uh, we zoomed uh, George Saunders today? Yeah, really are. I mean, he's just like a genius, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, he really, really is. We seem to say this after every time we interview a book or author. Uh, I think we are. So. Push <laughs> I, we are pushovers, I must say. But he, he I mean, it's, he's a genius writer and a pretty much a genius conversationalist as well, I would say. No. Yeah, I really liked what he was saying about sort of having to imagine himself into Lincoln um, until he sort of became him or Lincoln became George Saunders, because that's actually what happens in the novel. We don't hear much from Lincoln directly. What we hear is kind of spirits entering his body until they become the yeah. president. That was just a really nice parallel. Uh, that, so, uh, um, well, that's it for this week. You can find out more about Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders at thebookerprizes.com and remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and Substack at The Book of Prizes. Also, George's latest collection of short stories, Liberation Day, is now out in paperback. And warmly recommended. And don't forget, we also now have a Booker Prize book club on Facebook. So if you want to take part in that, please head to facebook.com slash thebookerprizes to find out more. Till next time, bye. Bye. Booker Prize podcast is hosted by Joe Hamia and me, James Walton. It's produced and edited by Kevin Miolo. And the executive producer is John Davenport. It's a Daddy Supiot production for the Booker Prizes.